I think all, th all, all, all three of you, or three of you, three of the four, have talked about um, the importance of controlling credit creation yeah. and the fact there's no political appetite for this. Um, do you detect any interest in that from UK politicians, for example, Steve Baker or anyone else in the House of Commons, possibly Michael Meacher? Is there anyone? Lord of their Turner has basically come closest of, of the sort of um, major figures that, that potentially might have an influence in, in saying that. Um, at the conference I organized September last year um, in, in Winchester, he was a keynote speaker and basically he made the case for credit controls. Of course, he was very careful in wording it, um, but if you read the speech and the journalist that covered it, I think interpreted correctly, they, they slightly overstating that, you know, they said he is arguing uh, for introducing credit controls and basically that was his argument. But otherwise there's this immediate reaction, uh, oh, this is like an intervention, this is like a communist apparatchik type of yeah. uh, control, which um, is not true because it's a top-down uh, rule where the individual decisions are still left on the level of the private sector firms, the banks, and therefore it, this is not a fair comparison. Um, also, it's a fact that governments actually have argued for this in many countries, including the UK already, by saying we want banks to lend to small firms, Project Merlin and, and, and. It just hasn't been done in the right way and the incentive structure has been wrong. Um, and so this has been unsuccessful, but it can be done better. Thank you. Anyone else on that? No, no, there's nothing. Okay. Okay, um, question from the floor. The gentleman up here in the middle, uh, blue shirt. Thank, thank. In, is this working? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, Richard Werner and Steve Keen have both told us that um, money supply gets created by banks um, lending money to a customer and crediting his account with it. Nothing increases the money supply. But Hugh Davis has told us that Tridos Bank uh, is constrained in its lending by its ability to raise retail deposits. He's chosen to only raise them that way and not go to the market. Um, who, who is, but that's a real constraint. He doesn't seem to be able to just credit the customer and debit the customer. Um, so who is right of those two and what's the result of that? So who would like to I'll answer? We'll both go, I think, but just, uh, the, it, the, the process they have in mind argues effectively that banks can only lend if they have the reserves available for it. Okay, they can't lend beforehand. And as I cut that quote from the um, Vice President of the New York Fed back in 1969, the banks lend first and look for the reserves later. Now the way it actually works technically, back in the 1960s, as Alan Holmes explains in that paper, the reserves that banks were required to have on hand were based on the deposits they had two weeks earlier. So if you actually create a loan and create a deposit, Richard was explaining that point as well, you create the loan, create the deposit, it, it percolates through the system, and with two weeks later you've got to actually then balance the two out. You may have gone into a deficit there. The money's there to borrow from the other banks. Okay? And now, I thought, I guess this would be the case. There's a paper by, our, um, oh, it's actually O'Brien, I think, I can't think of his first name, but a paper in 2009 from the OECD talking about the actual reserve systems of all the major OECD nations. They've now blown it out from two weeks to one month. So in other words, they've even got more flexibility. So the control process that the conventional thinkers like Posen think or apply, where you know, reserves first, deposits later, it's the rever other way around completely. So in fact, the reserves really act as a clearinghouse mechanism, but also stopping a run on the banks by having physical cash handy but, when necessary. But the reality of what you said was that he was constrained. His bank could not lend more yes. than it took in a deposit. Yes, yeah, Richard can handle that one. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so to, to put what Steve is saying, um, sort of to, to apply this directly on, on Triodos, and on this case, I would say well, any individual bank um, is able to first lend and therefore create the money, create the deposits. Um, but of course, the moment the money is withdrawn by the borrower, it may end up with another bank. If you've only got one bank in the country, and in the UK we're very close to that, then, um, then of course there is no problem because the money will always come back. This is why we have the interbank market where the banks, and, and Steve's referring to that, 
borrow from each other. Now, therefore, we know, and this, this is what Steve is saying, the banks can get the money from other banks because by lending more, they are creating more money that will be in the system. There will be some banks that have more than they need for the balance sheet to balance and others have less. This is why, of course, why this, with this whole crisis, the interbank market was such a focus of attention because you need that one to work for the whole system you know, to function and not to collapse because this is where the money is being pushed around between banks so that their balance sheets all balance. Now, to come back to Triodos, so each individual bank can make their own decisions about how prudent they want to run their bank and how much they want to rely on the interbank wholesale market. Northern Rock is an example of a bank that relied clearly very excessively on that. And thanks to the crisis, more banks are aware that that could be risky. I suspect Triodos Bank is on the other end of the spectrum as a very ethical bank and is likely also to be a very prudent bank and it may have had an internal decision not to rely on the interbank market at all. I don't know. Yeah, it has. Yeah. Um, and in that case, of course, the game, the rule of the games are different, but it's self-imposed and doesn't change the story we're telling. I think Steve wants to. One actually, John Carney, who's a, he actually is a, runs a major site for CNBC. I didn't think I'd ever be saying you should read a CNBC entry in a public meeting like this, but I will. Uh, he gives a very good explanation of what actually constrains banks, because he was a banker. And he said they're constrained largely by their, their cost of funds, by the likelihood that they think of getting their money back, the, the margins involved in having to you know, go through do loan evaluations, the infrastructure of a bank and so on, and they will stop at a certain point, but they're constrained more by the profitability of what they do rather than the physical, physical inability to put the money out there. Whereas the neoclassical vision has a physical inability in Krugman's case once the ATMs run out of money. Uh, so it, it, it is unrealistic. The realistic thing, uh, ask a banker, ask a central, some central bankers as well, don't listen to a neoclassical economist. But I, I just I think you're not answering the question, no. which is that I, I thought the Triodos, Hugh from Triodos, he's not here anymore, is he? He's he he gone. Go. He was implying in his presentation that he would only lend what he already had deposited. Hmm. So That's what I said. So there can be each bank can have their own rules about this, right. how much they want to rely on the wholesale market okay. and how much they want to f fund lending entirely from deposits. Right. And I suspect, as I said, you know, Trudeau's made this decision to be mm. very, very prudent, not rely on the wholesale market at all, in which case they're more constrained, of course. Okay, can we move on to the next question? Are we going to group them in threes? I'd, or? I'd suggest so. Um, okay, um, the lady in the purple staff, scarf in the middle. Thank Absolutely. you. Yeah. Um, on the question of, of credit controls, um, I speak on economics for the Green Party, and we do now have somebody in the House of Commons, which is Caroline Lucas, and it's actually our policy to have credit controls and exchange controls. And this kind of takes me on to my main point, which is about how we see ourselves. Because I, I get a sense, a sort of flavour here, that we're, we're feeling a bit campaigny and a bit critical. And um, it's really important that we see ourselves as taking the power. And I think we need to see it in terms of political economy, you know, not separate those two. So we're hearing a lot of people hacking off at economists. You know, I know I'm an economist, but I also hack off at economists a lot. But what I would like to think of us doing is feeling that, that you know, we have people in this room who will be the politicians and the economists of the future that will make these things happen. So my question to the panel is, how do you think we can inspire 10 people under the age of 30 in this room to be the economists that we want them to be in 20 years' time? Um, behind there, um, three, three rows behind, there's a uh, lady in the blue jumper. Thanks. Well, I, I felt very inspired by those that stress the urgency and therefore the, the need to think strategically. And so I wanted to ask a question really about how we link activity around the real economy and seeing that following Mary's point, not just in terms of what's measured by GDP but also all those activities including recognising negative activities that are not valued adequately by GDP <coughs> but how we, we link pressure in, in the real economy because in a sense the implication of most of the, a lot of the argument is we've got to shift away from speculation to investing in the real economy. Mm -hmm. So, okay, how do we develop, there's got to be a pressure side to it as well as the action on the financial institutions. And in order to think strategically about that, it seems there's a, a key point we've got to um, recognise in thinking about the golden age, which <coughs> Anna rightly 
point sister. But, but one that maybe hasn't been stressed here, which is, you know, you, people have stressed the, the deregulation and the sort of attraction for capital of moving into the financial sector. But there was also the sort of push factor. There's also the fact, if you ask, why was there all that money wanting to go from production into <coughs> finance? Yeah. And that was because of, you know, the, the, what was happening in production, the, the developing power of the workers or the developing pressures in the public sector from women and you know all the new needs yeah. and in a sense we've got to learn I mean lessons from that you know there's a lot of that workers strength wasn't translated enough into alternative ideas about production there were good examples but that, that needs to be now generalized yeah. and so I suppose the implication is now how do we um, <clears throat> link the kind of analysis and campaigning issues put here around finance to the um, campaigning issues that are developing around the uh, green economy. I mean, a, an alliance is being set up at this minute that Anne's very involved in, but also to the uh, campaigning going on, and in Edinburgh there's been real success, around not just defending public services, but improving and developing them. Okay, can and we, can we yeah, stop that one? So that's okay, one more question. Uh, the man with the beard behind, um, just behind her. Uh. Thanks, it's been a, a great session and a brilliant, um, a much more a real sense of the dialogue between neoclassical and uh, the alternative or heterodox model. But the point, I, I don't think that the point that this needs to be brought out is the ideological point. Uh, Hayek and Friedman have retrained generations of economists to think public, bad, private, good. We now have a private, essentially, a private banking supply, but there's no longer the political will because of that retraining amongst mm. economists or politicians to go against the belief system, the, stru the belief structure of neoliberalism. Which, so therefore, you, cannot, you can't persuade these people that the money supply is a public good anymore, nor can you persuade them that public action can redeem a public good. The Tories in England, particularly, are, are, are devoting enormous energies to persuading American companies to buy into British higher education, British secondary schools, and the British National Health Service. They're doing that because they all in the cabinet in England genuinely believe that private, is the, private action is the only to way to promote the public good of freedom, welfare, justice. So the trouble is that our, the, 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 the repair that's being proposed is deeply anti-ideological to the, to the reigning ideology. And it's not a science that we're really talking about then in terms of neoclassical economics. We're talking about a governing ideology. Okay, thank you. So who wants to start? Um, I mean, we've got three things there, haven't we? We've got, yeah. 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 Well, I'd like to start with, with Hillary's point. I think um, the left and greens and progressive people have on the whole focused on the real economy, on, on production, on labor, on the public sector. These are all tangible things that we engage with and know about. We don't engage with the finance sector on the whole, except, you know, in a remote sense. Um, and so we have just stayed away from it. And this partly d addresses Michael's point that w this is not a thing we talk about. It's not an issue uh, amongst uh, people on the left on the whole. And, and, you know, we have real problems with sort of very radical lefties who just have a blind spot for the finance sector. And what happened in the 1970s was there wasn't a revolution. You know, they didn't go out and do anything very dramatic. They didn't even put... Uh, legislation through Parliament. You know, the, the Bank of England would just change its rules and introduce a new thing called competition credit control, say. So, and all of this happened without the oversight, if you like, of, of, of democratic oversight. But I blame them for that. You know, they're very skillful at doing this. Uh, they pay a lot of money to make sure these changes happen. It costs them a great deal to get these regulatory changes. Mm -hmm. And they're willing to make the sacrifice to get those changes. We have taken our eye off that ball in, 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 you know, in the biggest sense of the world. We just don't think about finance. And we don't focus on it. We don't think about reforming it. But we, because what we find easier is the tangible stuff of trade, of you know, fair trade, of public services, of the things that we engage with. And for me, that's a, a big mindset that has to change. Yeah. Um, on the, uh, the, the last point about the ideology, that's one reason I've got proposals which 
are actually not particularly ideological. In fact, the, uh, the, when I talk about the Jubilee shares idea and the pill to people in, uh, in positions of power, they worry about the practicality, but they don't see it as being ideological because what it actually says is uh, we're trying to promote the primary market so you get more money going to actual investment rather than speculation. So uh, it is an issue about avoiding that ideological hang-up. And don't forget that there was probably the same ideological hang-up in the late 1920s as well. Only after you know six or seven years of the Great Depression did that whole belief that the private sector can do no wrong finally just get eliminated and you probably went too far in the other direction. I am somebody who's critical of seeing what happens to bureaucratic mindsets and how bureaucrats are really focused upon not making a mistake more so than doing something. And I'm sure there's a lot of academics in the room who are sick and tired of having bureaucrats trying to make sure you don't make mistakes, which means you spent 11 months of 12 writing research proposals and one month of 12 called your holidays actually doing something. <laughs> so there's, there is a reason to watch out for that bureaucratic mindset as well. We shouldn't just you know, swing back and say public good, private bad. Uh, the other extreme. It's, it's a balance of the two. In terms of how we inspire a new generation of economists, I'm trying to build a range of dynamic tools for economic thinking. And the package I'm working on now with the grant for mine is called Minsky. To make this stuff up to date, computer simulated graphical user interface, not just fun to play with and, and, and sexy in a computer sense, but able to scale all the way to modeling the economy in a heuristic way, in the same way that meteorologists do model the weather in a more, uh, a more numerical way. And that to me is far more interesting than neoclassical economics. You've got to have a serious tendency towards autism to find that stuff cool. Okay? But I want to get people who've got a serious tendency towards biological thinking, dynamics, evolution and so on, to find they've got far cooler tools that they can make the other autistic lot look pretty dull with and we can take it over, if necessary, from the outside because there's no way economics will reform itself from the inside. Can I, can I say that also we shouldn't be despairing. There's an awful lot happening. You know, there's yeah. a, the new, what is it called, the World Association, World Economics Association, yeah. which everyone can join. There's the rebellion against the control of the journals over economic publications. Mm. There is an arrest of uprising happening because people know that the London School of Economics didn't, couldn't get it. You know, when the Queen asked, why didn't you tell us? You know, they had no answer. So, but it's deeply frustrating, I imagine, for undergraduates going into college now because they still have these old curricula. But there is, there is change and we've just got to push it along. Yeah, Richard. Of course, on the on the last point, the the controls still apply as as far as the the journals um, are concerned, and they're being uh, I think tightened. These screws are being tightened just in the last uh, two years more than ever mm. um, in the UK, particularly because uh, of the cuts um, of spending to universities, um, and so that that problem persists. Um, just a brief comment on 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 this uh, this issue. What how can we um, propose something and move forward when it seems to go against this ideology, the prevailing thinking that public is bad, private is good. Well, I think um, Mary, Mary made, a, made a good point on that one. The public actually believes bank deposits are public money. And at the same time, the public also believes that it is it is a government thing. It's the government that issues money ultimately. They can't usually articulate this very well, but this is the common thinking. I did a survey um, taxi. of around, well, in the taxi as well. I always ask people, but um, a sort of formal survey of around 1,000 people. Uh, there was a bias that in that they were somewhat more educated than average, but that's a sort of bias against you that, that you want. And the question was, you know, who do you think creates the money supply? And of course, 83, 84% thought either the government or the central bank. Um, and also asked the question, would you agree with a system whereby the majority of the money supply is created and allocated by private profit-oriented enterprises according to their own decisions? 94% said no. So we have the public backing us, and they just need we need to reach out to them. So even if we can't convince ideological economists, um, I think uh, you know the public will be on our side, despite the prevailing economic ideology. I think Steve's got a very quick thing. Yeah, to a couple of clarification points. One real way that we get screwed in economics is that university administrations, who don't know uh, economics as deeply as we do, 
uh, we're trying to raise the quality of their research profile and so if you can't get published in the A-star journals, you're low quality and they try to drive you out. And they've actually been economists sacked over that at a place like, like uh, Notre Dame in America. That is in taking the beautiful way that Anne put it a moment ago. The creationists dominate the, the profession. The evolutionists are on the outside trying to come in and say that ain't how it happens. The creationists refuse to pub publish the evolutionary articles. And if you actually had the quality control per policy being applied, we'd still back be, you know, we'd be with learning the earth was 5,000 years old. So we have to convince the university administrators that you can't apply that quality mechanism to, an, to the discipline of economics which desperately needs a paradigm shift to bring it forward 500 years. Uh, if I can explain one other okay, we've got, point. Sorry, we've, got, we've yeah. got limited time. Can we can move to the Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. We've, um, two more questions, and I think I saw Josh over there um, and the gentleman with the grey hair there, please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to raise two points uh, which might expand the debate slightly, or observations rather than questions. Um, we have to w do away with this ridiculous assumption that listed companies are owned by their shareholders, um, which I think is part of the point that Steve Keen made. Um, it's a total fallacy and it distorts our thinking. And the second thing I think we need to think about is that when banks accept money from depositors, the, mon the money legally becomes theirs. It is not a loan which you give to the bank, you give the bank your money and it becomes their money and that is again part of the problem. Credit unions don't suffer from that problem. Mm. Yeah. And Josh, the last one. Thanks. And um, I mean, it's great to see um, s some of the larger NGOs supporting this conference. And, and I had a question which maybe uh, people in the audience might be better placed to answer, but I'm sure the panel will have some thoughts on it. Um, at NAF, we've, we've we really struggled to get funding to work on these kinds of issues and have been for many years. And we struggle, um, and I know Positive Money had this issue as well, we, we struggle actually to get funding even from some of the larger NGOs, um, uh, you know, the global NGOs. And I just wondered why this might be and what what sort of... I mean, how can we try and reposition this debate so that there is a focus on these structural fundamental issues such as credit creation, such as the structure of the financial system, so that these larger NGOs you know, fund research in the area, maybe supporting academics as well as campaigning, and shift the balance of power, because at the moment there really is very little funding coming from civil society in that direction. Can we just squeeze one more question in, actually? Yes. Thank you. Um, Andrea from the World Development Movement. I just would like to ask if you're able to offer your personal opinion on whether you think more of or less of the kind of actions we've seen last year of Occupy and UK Uncut are um, going to help this um, uh, help this change or or do you think people have taken notice of it in the in the power areas? I would I mean I would answer the Occupy one. I, I definitely think that has um, played a, sign a significant role because it's uh, it's made people a w you know it's e very easy to, to der deride them and they have been derided in a lot of the mainstream media particularly the Daily Mail but you know they when people like a uh, not a dare turner when people like Hector Sense actually went and sat in one of the tents and talked about bank re regulation you know that did get some serious coverage and on my personal view the Occupy movement has generally been very positive for for you know, raising awareness of the need for reform. But I, I would I would agree with that. I think yeah. it's it's healthy and it's it's a result of you know it shows civil society taking an active interest, uh, moving, doing something about things, and and the media couldn't ignore it. Even the mainstream media that that violently disagreed with some of the the claims um, or you know the, the goals. And so I think that's been very healthy. Uh, on the other question, I would I would entirely ag agree actually with the two statements you made, um, and it's important to keep that in mind. Um, you know, the issue of um, you know who are the actual shareholders in terms of exercising shareholder rights. Um, it's a mythical concept, of the shareholder. And then yes, when you give your money to the bank, it belongs to the bank, which is the um, part of the. The legal aspect, how this the system was legalized over over history, over time, and uh, if again, if more people were aware of that, that they wouldn't be happy with it. So I think we do have the public with us on this. We just need to keep informing 
And I think that will also inspire then more and more people to come forward as they have. And so hopefully there'll be some change. I want to say I'm a bit skeptical about Occupy um, because, and you know, I think it was wonderful. I think the very concept of Occupy was great. Occupy Wall Street, Occupy the City of London. Um, you know, this belongs to us. But it doesn't go anywhere from there. And I think the really important thing for us to recognize is that we have to organize and we have to organize politically. And um, there's great distaste for politics these days and distaste for getting involved in political uh, organization and activity. But actually, it's the only way things are going to change. And I, I fear that what it is is a sort of outburst of anger but it's not channeled, and it's not channeled into clear asks, and, and I'm afraid you do have to know what you want, basically, and then you have to go for it. And I, I fear that at the moment it's just, whoa, but not, and, and that will no doubt come at some point, but it, we're, not, we're a long way from it, and that requires mobilization, organization, and discipline. Um, I'll I agree with both those comments. So what I'll uh, bring us back to is the question about trying to get you know, funding to do the research, as Joss was saying a while ago, or getting support. Because one thing about the Occupy movement is seen as being anti-capitalist. Now, ultimately, uh, maybe we have to consider that in, uh, sometime down the track. Uh, maybe capitalism isn't compatible with a sustainable ecology on the planet, et cetera, et cetera. No, no problem with this, this discussing that. But the financial crisis is actually a battle between industrial and financial capital. And industrial capital doesn't tend to realize that until after it's got screwed again by financial capital. So I often say we have a strong interest in workers and, in, and industrial capitalists getting together to contain the financial system. Yeah, but that's what's yeah. always caused the, uh, I'm thinking of a very French Australian word there, the stuff ups in the, uh, in, the, in the capitalist system. And that's why I had great fun quoting a certain bearded gentleman from the 19th century when I wrote a post called The Roving Cavaliers of Credit, because Marx had it spot on as well. This is the quote. Talk about centralisation. The credit system, which has its focus in the so-called national banks and the big money lenders and usurers surrounding them, constitutes enormous centralisation and gives this class of parasites the fabulous power not only to period periodically despoil industrial capitalists, but also to interfere in the actual production in the most dangerous manner. And this gang knows nothing about production and has nothing to do with it. It's so Tommy made that the general ideology of a functioning capitalism. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank, and if you could please give a round of applause to the panel. Thanks, Dan. Okay. That was fun. <laughs>